Today on Talk Bolton. A look at what Every happens behind bars at the Fulton County Jail. The sheriff agrees to permit innocent participants to become inmates for 60 days. We'll hear from the Fulton County Chief Jailer who will explain why the cameras were allowed in the Rice Street facility and we'll hear what they have already learned. I'm Shawnya Chavis Rucker and Talk Fulton starts right now. Welcome to Talk Fulton, everyone. Today we are talking about the startling look inside the Fulton County Jail thanks to a special television program produced by the A&E Network. Now the show is called 60 Days In and it chronicles the day in the life of Fulton County inmates including just over a dozen willing participants who are also locked up who've done nothing wrong. Take a look. The Fulton County Jail is the face of incarceration in this country. If I'm going to find solution to these problems, I'm going to need some inside information. I want to bring light to a lot of inequality. It's a factory that ruins people's lives. Something's wrong. This is definitely bigger than me. They're building prisons faster than they're building schools. If I can make change for one person, it'll all be worth it. We all track. So why would officials at the Fulton County Sheriff's Office allow the cameras to take us behind the scenes for what in some cases even surprised them? Colonel Mark Adger is the Fulton County Chief Jailer. Sir, welcome back to Talk Fulton. Hi, Shania. It's great to be here. It's great to have you. So, okay, so the production company who produces the television program called uh, 60 Days In for the A&E Network, I assume came to you and the sheriff for permission to tape at your facility. Tell us how all of this came about. Well, it's just like you said, um, after season one of 60 Days In and Clark County began airing, and I, I was watching it from the very first episode, uh, the producers of 60 Days In contacted the sheriff and wanted to know if he was interested in uh, participating in this program. Uh, they had considered that we had already done uh, programming on A&E before, uh, Beyond Scared Straight. Uh, they thought that we would be an excellent uh, facility to, to do this project in. And uh, when we considered all the ups and the downs of doing this, we, we said, sure, let's, let's do it. And so the production company was granted permission, uh, placed the cameras in the facility, and they also paid a filming fee as well. Tell me about the cameras. What, what did they do in the, in the facility? Well, what they did is they uh, installed um, some high-definition pan-tilt-zoom cameras in the day room so that they could follow inmates around uh, as they engaged in their activities in the day room, but they also installed cameras in some of the uh, cells where the inmates uh, sleep and live with one other inmate. So they pretty much were able to keep their eyes on the participants uh, throughout their stay in the Fulton County Jail. And so tell us now, what were the rules? I know you had to have some rules going in in terms of what they could and what they could not film. Well, uh, basically, uh, they had to have a consent or release form signed by any inmate that who, who appears on camera. Uh, also, they could not film uh, certain private activities such, such as inmates going to the restroom or taking showers, of course. Um, but other than that, uh, they had free reign of the facility. They were able to interview inmates at will. They were able to follow inmates in their housing units uh, using their cameras both mounted to the facility and uh, cameramen walking around and uh, shooting uh, photography uh, with handheld. So it was a very interesting process. And so now you know I've got to ask because I'm sure when people see the, uh, the promos for the, uh, for the series, it's, it's quite jarring. So you know, I know you have had this question, why did you want to do this? Well, I thought this would be, and, and it is, after doing this, uh, it is, the only way that you could get the information that we got uh, doing this entire process. Um, the one thing that jail administrators cannot allow to happen is to become self-deluded, that they don't have problems that actually do exist. Uh, this process exposed uh, issues that, that we have, um, and fortunately for us, there are issues that, that are easily correctable, 
And uh, after we learned about, you know, what are some of the things that were causing us issues, we were able to correct those situations and, and, and have a better facility for it. And we will talk more in depth about exactly what you found out. But uh, talk to me um, in terms of uh, you had some outsiders in. What were you thinking that you were going to be able to gain through the fact that you had some outsiders in the facility? Well, you know, we're, we're no strangers to undercover operations in the Fulton County Jail. We've had undercover operatives in the jail before, but they typically were law enforcement or paid uh, undercover informants, and they were only in for short durations. So the amount of information that you could get was very limited. Uh, by bringing in outsiders, uh, we were able to bring in a, a diverse uh, group of individuals from different walks of life, different kinds of occupational specialties, uh, people who have different perspectives on the criminal justice system. So by doing that, we were able to get a cross spectrum of individuals that could give us information uh, that's not tainted by what our expectations were. And when we're talking about uh, jail staff, I'm, I'm sure you had to have some, some perspective of doing this as it even related to jail staff? Oh, absolutely. We wanted to know how jail staff related with inmates, uh, how they work, what difficulties that jail staff have uh, supervising inmates, along with what can we do to train our staff to be more engaged uh, with the inmate issues. And one, that's one of the things that's very difficult to do because this is a very stressful job. We're already asking our people to do uh, one, you know, humendous uh, amount of work when it comes to engaging with inmates and then we're asking them to be counselors in some instances. We're, we're asking them to uh, do things that they weren't really trained to do. So this really told us what we needed to do to make our staff better. But it also told us what we needed to do to program inmates. Um, one of the things is that you have expectations that people want to get better, they want to be better, and that's not always true. Uh, one of the things that we have to overcome are the expectation of the inmates, and uh, some of those expectations do not lend themselves to the current uh, programming that we provide. And speaking of programming, uh, what were you hoping uh, that you would glean as it relates to the services and programs of the actual facility? Well, I wanted to know how receptive the inmates would be to the programs that we're providing now and the programs that we're going to be providing in the future. Uh, one of the things that we have to overcome, especially with a young inmate, and I'm talking about individuals between the ages of 18 and 24, is their limited life expectation that they have. A lot of these guys don't think they're going to live past the age of 25, so they believe that there's no point in bothering to engage in a lot of these programs, or if they do, that they're not taking it seriously. So we, we have to get that mindset changed in, in this group of young men, especially, uh, that uh, there is a possibility that they will live past the age of 25, there's life beyond 25, and that they have to plan to live that life. That is so hard to hear, you know, uh, um, we're just having a conversation and to hear you say that there's some young people out there that don't even think that they will go beyond 25, they're just baby, so uh, I'm sure you definitely wanted to uh, get some insight on that. Uh, talk to me about that, the two-tier program, or the two-tier system, as, as you all name, where you name it. Is it something that you were trying to, uh, to understand uh, with that system? Well, yeah, you know, we, we talk, a couple of years ago, we decided to operate uh, our housing units on a tier, two-tier protocol. And what that means is that the inmates that, that live on the lower tier are out in the day room separately from the inmates that live in the upper tier. And we did that to reduce conflict, especially in areas of the jail where there's high gang involvement. Uh, we don't have enough jail space to uh, separate everybody that's in a gang from an adversary in another gang. So we have to do that. Uh, instead of using space, we have to use time. Uh, one of the complaints with doing that, and I completely understand the concern, is that inmates spend too much time locked down. So the question becomes, do we keep individuals safe and keep them locked down longer, or do we allow individuals to have more time out of their cells, but in the company of people that uh, they have conflict with? And I think this project answered that question quite sufficiently. I, I believe it's a lot safer to maintain a two-tier protocol and keep people uh, separated in time so that we can keep them safe uh, in their space. 
So talk to me a little bit about uh, the, the willing participants that uh, you had in the facility. Um, did anybody know that they were undercover? And, and, and I was interested in hearing that this is not the first undercover operation you've done. So did anybody know who they were and, and how did that work? Well, like all of our other undercover operations, staff uh, were not informed, did not know mm. that we had participants in the jail that were going to be serving uh, up to 60 days in our custody. I had just a handful of people that were brought in uh, that knew, uh, and that was because of the way that we had to bring them in. But other than that, the staff in general, all housing uh, staff, anyone that had contact on a regular uh, basis with the participants did not know that there were undercovers present in the jail. And you know, before we take a break, I do want to ask you one question. Uh, Fulton County had uh, long been under a federal consent decree and, and uh, you all had taken great strides in getting the facility uh, to such that it could be released from the decree. Were you concerned at all that this, this, this broad look uh, inside the facility uh, may cause some issues as it relates to that? No, I don't think so because we're being proactive. We're, we're looking for where our weaknesses are and we're going to correct those weaknesses and they will not exist uh, beyond uh, what you see in, in the two seasons that we're participating in. So I, I think our proactive approach is, is going to handle that uh, issue. Also, we're, you know, in Fulton County, we're doing criminal justice reform. That's right. We have several initiatives that are in place. I think uh, the fact that we're doing these initiatives uh, speaks volumes to our commitment to uh, running a safe, sound, and constitutional facility. All right, well, Colonel, let's take a break for a minute. When we come back, uh, we'll hear about what happened when the cameras started rolling and what was learned. Stay with us, everybody. Well, we're back and we've been talking about the A&E Network's look at the Fulton County Jail for their television series called 60 Days In. Colonel Mark Adger, Chief Jailer for the Fulton County Sheriff's Office is with us. So, Colonel, all right, so when the producers and your team got a chance to look at the tape, tell us about some of what you all discovered and then we will talk about what you will do now as a result of those findings. And let's take them one at a time. What would you say was the first thing that you really noticed? The first thing that I noticed was the ease that inmates were able to smuggle contraband in through our intake unit. Um, you know, we had made several concessions on our intake unit when it came to uh, how we do strip searches back there uh, because uh, the courts have determined that not everyone is required to endure a strip search. So we typically only searched those individuals that we knew were going to go into population here at the jail. They had no way of uh, making bond or were going to be released by the courts. Um, so after realizing that uh, the intake unit was the main source of contraband coming into the jail, we had to make some substantial changes to our processes. And I know that um, because obviously you don't want to tell everybody what you're going to do now in terms of making some changes, but, uh, but clearly, as you just said, you saw that you're going to make some changes and have those changes already been made? Oh, yes, they have definitely <laughs> been made and they have paid off uh, tremendously in the interdiction of contraband. And I was reading some of the notes. I had a chance to look at uh, some of your follow-up uh, reports as it relates to this particular program. And you said on there that uh, the inmate handbook was not issued at intake and inconsistent enforcement of policies and procedures. What exactly did that mean? Well, basically, we, we have an expectation of inmates that when they come into the jail that they're going to follow our rules and regulations. But the, the only way you can have that expectation is if you give them the rules and regulations for them to learn. Uh, so to fix that issue, we're going to make that document available electronically in every housing unit so that they can get that document uh, one way or another, either in hand and paper, or they'll be able to read it from their uh, housing unit kiosk. And, and I know that uh, in one of the promos for the program, um, the very young men all talked about gangs. What, what did you learn? Well, you know, we, we knew that we had a huge gang issue inside the jail. Uh, we do gang investigations both inside the jail and outside the jail. 
But what we learned about uh, the gang activity, especially when we uh, suspended the, the tiered uh, lockout uh, protocols, was that uh, a lot of these guys are in the same gangs and they're being victimized by uh, older gang members or gang members with uh, higher tenure. So it was just amazing to me the, the level of violence that these guys engage in, uh, even amongst themselves, who are, are supposed to be at least friendly towards one another, that they tolerate such a level of violence that we're just not used to seeing. And, and we know that anybody who knows you know you are no nonsense, and uh, particularly as it relates to your expectations uh, of your staff. I understand that um, you found out some things even as it relates to staff and uh, working in silos or something to that nature. Tell us about that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, and let me say, I, I think I have one of the greatest jail staffs uh, you could possibly have, but one of the problems that we have is that there is so much work that has to be done that we get more focused on checking off the list of all the things that we, ha we have to do rather than actually focusing on a task at hand and keeping our situational awareness about us. Um, just because you're doing one thing doesn't mean you should not be aware of what's going on someplace else. So I've tasked my uh, managers and, and floor supervisors to train their uh, line staff to keep our colleagues fully engaged and aware about what's going on in other areas. But you know, to, to be fair, to do that reasonably, uh, we have to have equipment as well. And, and I was going to ask about that. I, yes. I was going to ask about, even, even as it relates to the cameras, I mean, the, the, the beauty of what you just went through was the fact that you had all these cameras in the facility that you did not pay for. Uh, and so even when you were talking about video surveillance, what, what, did, what did you glean? Well, you know, the, the old, uh, surveillance systems that we have in the jail just not up to the task. Um, there's a lot of activity that happens underneath the stairs in each one of those housing units that you cannot see from the surveillance camera that's posted in that housing unit. Uh, so although it looks obvious to the viewer of the program, it's not something that's obvious to the staff that's looking at that camera in that control station. So we've got to do m much better in, in placement and, and types of cameras that we're using for video surveillance. And, and what about the participants and, and what you learned from them? What, what, what do you think you really learned as it relates to, what is it, was it um, about 12 or 13 of, of them in there? All in total was about uh, 17 participants. Oh, wow. And what do you think you, you really learned from them? I, you know, I learned so much from each one. Um, and having that many participants, uh, we were able to validate information that we got from each one uh, versus the other. Uh, but a lot of these guys and gals uh, gave of themselves to do this. Uh, they, one of the things that I really learned, uh, going back to this expectation that inmates have of not living very long, came from one particular participant who's you know of the same age group and was able to communicate with these guys and get inside and, and they told them things that uh, was, was happening in their lives. Um, that ability to, to, to measure these inmates and fit in where you can and get the information that's required to come out to give to me in the debriefing was something that these participants took seriously. And you're talking a little bit about uh, some of what you liked. What else uh, did you really have an appreciation for as it related to this experience beyond even what you were able to learn? Well, that, um, that inmates, and it's weird that you have to say this, that, that inmates are people, human being too, and we can't forget that. That's right. One of the things that I told my staff when we revealed what we did in, this, in the jail was that these participants had not done anything to be locked up in jail. They were completely innocent individuals. Hey, can uh, I stop you there for a second? Sure. So the last place I want to be is in a jail. Uh, what would make them want to do this? What was the benefit for them? Well, a lot of them had, you know, baggage wow. in their lives that they wanted to understand. Uh, you had individuals who had family members that had gone to jail and they wanted to understand those family members better. Uh, some of them had never been to jail themselves. As a matter of fact, none of them had ever been to jail themselves. 
but they were engaged with individuals who had been to jail and they wanted to understand those individuals, especially the ones that mentor in their communities. Uh, they're mentoring young people uh, who are at risk and they thought it would be very difficult to tell an at-risk youth why right. you shouldn't go to jail if they have never been to jail That's themselves. Right. So they, they wanted to learn that on their own so that they could relate. So I understand that um, the, the network uh, taped enough for, for two seasons. Yeah, they did. And um, what, what, have you had a chance to see all of it or, or are you seeing it as the public is seeing it? I, I've seen a, a good measure of it. I haven't seen all of it. I've seen um, um, a good sampling from both seasons to have an idea of what I needed to correct right away. Uh, there were issues, especially the, when you see uh, drugs being used in the jail, and those drugs are the drugs that we give them. These are prescription meds being abused. Yeah, let's talk about that. I, I, I wanted to get into that just a little bit more. Tell, tell me more about what you found out. Um, because in, in the video, it almost looks like they were chopping up cocaine, but that's not what that was, was it? No, no, it wasn't. It was, you know, the, a lot of psychotropic drugs that we give inmates, uh, they come in, we screen them. Uh, the, the medical people determine that they should be on a, a certain prescription. Uh, we provide that uh, prescription med and then in turn, instead of taking the medication, and that's the responsibility that's on us. Our medical provider and the security staff have to do a better job in making sure that, that inmates take their drugs, but when they don't, they abuse them. And, and you, as you saw, they, they chopped them up and smoked it and snorted it. And wow. It, it was just ridiculous. And so ridiculous. Clearly, clearly you have uh, adjusted whatever SOP is for, for that. You, you've addressed that. Yes, we're addressing that as we speak. Well, listen, I mean, we could sit here and talk to you. I should have scheduled this for two shows because we were just really uh, taken by um, uh, what we saw. And, and, and I will say, like many people, when I first saw it, I thought, oh, my goodness, uh, is this going to be a good look for the county? But the bottom line is it's, it's about fixing the problem. Absolutely. And, you know, Shania, I'll be glad to come back and talk to you again, especially as uh, we get into season four. Please, let's do it. It's, it, it consider it a date. Uh, Colonel Mark Adger, it is always a pleasure to have you on our show. Thank you so much for your time. No, you're welcome. It was great being here. Thank you. And everybody, we will be right back. Well, that does it for this edition of Talk Fulton. Special thanks to our guest today and a special thanks to you for watching. We invite you to email us to let us know what kind of topics you'd like to see addressed right here on Talk Fulton. That email address is fgtv.feedback at fultoncountyga.gov. I'm Shania Chavis-Rucker. We'll see you next time.